People tend to project on the world really how they are on the inside. If a person is looking at the world like, oh, everything is terrible and everyone hates me and all the world is out to get me, it's most likely something's going on on the inside and you're kind of projecting that on the world around you. We're not improving so that others will approve of us. We're improving because our lives are geared towards improvement. We, part of our reason of being here is to improve ourselves, to perfect our existence, to achieve as, as high as we can in every area of our lives, including and especially in our character. Welcome to the Jewish Marriage Podcast, your home for unique, insightful conversations about all things Jewish dating and marriage. Welcome, Rabbi Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's nice to finally meet you in real life. I've been seeing you for many years online. I think you're really one of the OGs of being a rabbi teaching online. How long ago did you start doing that? It's got to be uh, about 12 years or so. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very early. Okay, so I'm looking forward to the conversation very much. Before we start, do you want to just give our viewers a little bit of about yourself, tell them who you are and what you do? Sure. So um, I'm a Chabad rabbi in, um, in South Florida, but um, one of my main focuses uh, in general is, uh, so I, I'm also the director of the American Faith Coalition, which provides uh, people from all backgrounds with an introduction and an expansion of their relationship with God. Uh, so we have online programs, we have uh, individual coaching programs, uh, a lot of different things that help people sort of develop their relationship with their faith. Interesting. And is that like a, a non-denominational approach, the coalition? Uh, yeah, we, we, we take people from, from whatever faith background they, they had been raised with that, 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 are, that are inclined towards Torah, that are inclined towards Jewish wisdom, and uh, help develop their, their life and enhance their uh, relationship with their faith uh, through the wisdom of the Hebrew Bible. Oh, amazing. Okay. So I'm very happy that we have this opportunity because one of the things that we really wanted to talk about on the podcast is, you know, an individual's experience in dating and marriage and the relationship between their experience, how much of that is determined by the objective reality of their circumstances versus how much of that is determined by their mindset and their perspective. Because Throughout life, obviously, these things, you know, both the contributing factors, someone could, you know, the, the cliche glass half full versus half empty, or, you know, maybe someone wins the lottery and they won $10 million in the lottery. And some people will win the lottery and be super excited and happy and it made their day. And then you'll have someone else who wins the lottery for $10 million unexpectedly and says, well, that's like so frustrating because last week it was 100 million. Why didn't I win it last mm. week? Right. So same objective circumstance positive experience, negative experience. Um, can you speak to when it comes to the process of, of dating and marriage, can you speak to how much of that is determined by the objective reality of our circumstances versus how much of that is determined by our mindset and our perspective? Well, I think a lot is, a lot of it is determined by your circumstances, but Primarily, it's dependent upon what's going on on the inside. Uh, I like to tell people uh, when when they're in that in that phase of life, looking for their for their mate, rather than trying to find the right person on the outside, the focus should be first maybe trying to make yourself the quote unquote right person on the inside, and then the the right person will kind of show up. In other words, be the person that you would like to be, that you would like. Uh, your household to be created with that you would like to be over the course of your life and the right person will sort of show up for you to link together with and and, per, and make a family and uh, and do all the things that you want to do. So it, it does have to do a lot with, with shaping your own mindset, uh, working on your own character uh, rather than whatever circumstances you happen to be falling in. Okay, so I am wondering whether maybe there are two different things involved in what you just mentioned and it could be or maybe not depending on what you mean you talk about because you said towards the end of that working on mindset and developing character right now character we could look at mindset and character as being maybe synonymous but maybe they're two very different things and perhaps working on character and becoming the person broadly that you know we feel like we should be and would be the person that we're supposed to be is there maybe somewhat of a 
a karmic aspect to that and how that leads to, you know, then taking that person that we're supposed to be into the relationship that we're supposed to have. And is there somewhat of that sort of karma aspect? And then is it a separate thing that there is the mindset aspect? And when we work on our mindset and perspective, just very practically, that puts us in a position in which we're going to recognize things in a way that's more accurate and makes sense and practical rather than, you know, maybe being in, in la la land or, or delusional. Well, I, I think I think the second thing that you that you mentioned is it's kind of the way that it works, that depending on how your mindset is, that will defect that will affect how your how your character uh, will be shaped. So if you're thinking of if you look at life in a, in a particular way, you might realize, hey, my the way that I act, the way my habits, my my uh, my style doesn't really fall in sync with the the mindset and the worldview that I'm supposed to be living with. I want to kind of shape myself to you know to be more in line with this sort of mindset, uh, being a a more positive person, let's say, being more outgoing person, being more giving person, whatever whatever those whatever those things may be. People tend to project on the world really how they are on the inside. So if a, if a person is looking at the world like oh everything is terrible and everything everyone hates me and all the world is out to get me that's most likely not the case it's most it's most likely uh, something's something's going on on the inside and you're kind of projecting that on the world around you so if if I'm feeling like a mess inside I'm going to view the world as a mess and I'm going to if I feel that uh, that uh, I'm not where I want to be. I may look at the world as they're always out to get me. So the the way that we kind of feel on the inside does have a correlation with how we view the world. So we want to we want to get people in sync with where they are on the inside and how they how they're living their life. So would it be fair to say then that what you're suggesting is something along the lines of the fact that the primary focus should be on mindset and and part of the outcome of focusing on mindset is that that will bring along character development with it but that the outset is the primary thing that's the but that the mindset is the primary thing that's really going to produce or at least be a very powerful factor in producing a positive outcome in us moving forward in relationships in dating and in marriage rather than just being a means to an end to, to develop character, which will then lead us. There. Well, yeah, let, let, let me, there's, there's a story that I really like that I, that I think may help kind of shape this conversation. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's a story of, of a grandfather who was in his living room um, taking a nap on the couch and his grandchildren were, were visiting and they wanted to play a little joke. It was time for the grandfather to wake up and um, they decided rather than just wake him up outright, they were going to, they went into the refrigerator and they got a little canister of curdled cheese, a little, beginning to stink a little bit. And they were going to go over to their grandfather and put it under his nose and, uh, and wake him up like that. And so when they, were, when they were bringing the cheese close to their grandfather's nose, ac they accidentally got a little too close and a little bit of the curdled cheese went into the grandfather's nostrils. And the grandfather woke up and he was all, he was all confused. And the grandchildren, they, they ran away and they were kind of laughing, you know. And the, the grandfather, he's looking around, he stands up in his living room and he smells and he's, ugh, this room stinks. And he then walks into the dining room and he smells in the dining room. He's, ugh, the dining room stinks. And he walks into his bedroom, the bedroom, he's, ugh, it stinks in here. And every room that he goes to, he says, oh, it just stinks. And he walks outside and he takes a deep breath and he says, the whole world stinks. Not realizing that the stinky stuff was, was inside of him. And, and I, think, I think that's the way that we kind of work a lot of times in our lives is that when there's stinky stuff inside of us, we view the whole world as stinking. We view everything, that the whole world stinks. And oftentimes that, that can be a good reflection point of saying, hey, you know what? Maybe it's not the whole world. Maybe, maybe there's something inside myself that stinks. And um, that, that might be a good impetus to, to now work on something. Where, where is that stinkiness coming from? Where are those character traits or personality features, whatever it is, that I could perhaps tweak a bit, uh, work with, 
that will change my view of myself, of the world, of, of my life. Of why I'm here, maybe. Why I'm here, for sure. Okay, so th there's something that just a, a thought that's occurring to me and I'm processing as you're talking about this, and I'd like to run it by you and see what you, what you have to say. Because I think on one hand, it's true that a lot of times, obviously, you know, that's clearly the case, I think, that a person's perspective is going to have a very strong impact on how they perceive the world. Um, sometimes that perception that they have, let's say that, you know, that there's the cheese that's in their nose, that, that way that they have of viewing the world negatively, judgmentally, critically, whatever it is. I think it's very common that a person will develop that perspective or that characteristic in response to something that did really happen at some point, And that sets them off on a track of looking at things a particular way or viewing things a particular way. And maybe, you know, they feel like, well, it is true because look what happened. And therefore, it makes sense that I'm looking at the whole world this way. And maybe the, a, 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 an important part of this process could be for them to understand that, yes, that negative thing did happen. And I do have, let's say, a valid, you know, critique or negative view of that thing that happened. And it makes sense to look at it that way, but then recognize that that doesn't therefore translate onto everyone and everything and mean that that's, you know, the way that the whole world works. And therefore I have to perceive everything else that way. That's absolutely true because there can be legitimate things that a person experienced that were that were very difficult. Uh, it could be your, your parents, your surroundings, your teachers, your friends, whoever it was, maybe early on in life, uh, did something or you perceived something and you began looking at yourself and the world in a particular way. Um, but one of the things that I think we have to understand at a certain point is that your history doesn't have to shape your destiny. You don't have to, you're, you're, the experiences that happen to us don't have to be, and shouldn't be in many instances, a life sentence for this is just the way my life is going to continue going forevermore. If there's something that, if a person isn't happy, isn't living with a sense of well-being, is, doesn't feel good about life, oftentimes that can be that can be adjusted. And the, the adjustment starts not by necessarily changing where you are and, and uh, what you're doing. It, can, it starts with, with an internal discovery, an internal journey. And that helps shape the world and, and zero in on where our purpose lies. All right. And I guess then when we separate those two things, a person can then be in a position to be able to say, yes, I'm, I'm going to you know, look at the world maybe in a more positive light and see purpose and see meaning and, you know, treat people with respect and assume the best in people without that necessarily being at the expense of, you know, or without that necessarily coming to invalidate the experience that they did have and say, well, no, that's not true. No, you didn't experience that. Or it wasn't really the way you remembered, or it didn't really have the effect that you think it did because we can say, and I think I like the way you put it, that, that our history doesn't have to determine our destiny, which means that we can separate them and say, no, I'm going to shift my destiny but not at the expense of the truth of the history. It's just that they can be separated without having to be married to each other. Exactly. And it's kind of like the concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you now, you now agree that whatever the person may have done to you was the correct thing, or like you're whitewashing it and pretending like it didn't happen. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness means that, yes, what happened perhaps was terrible, but I'm not going to let that control my life. Forgiveness isn't really about the other person. Forgiveness is something that happens to us internally, something that we can can utilize internally, that that person is not going to take up rent, is not renting from me free of charge for the rest of my life. I'm putting it out. Again, that doesn't affect, that doesn't change the fact that what what they did was wrong. I'm not, I'm not excusing their behavior or saying that, eh, it was, eh, don't worry about it. What I'm saying is that what they did was wrong, but I'm not going to let that be a thing that controls me for the rest of my life. And it works a similar way with, with all, all other um, instances, situations uh, that, that we've been in. It's not that those things didn't happen. It's not that bad stuff didn't happen. It's not that situations didn't shape who I am. It's just that I'm not going to let those things define who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. 
and always go back and blame, well, the reason I never achieved what I wanted to achieve or got where I wanted to go or lived a life that was happy and satisfying was because of that person or that situation. Inner freedom comes when you recognize, when you don't let that person or that situation determine who you're going to be. Right. And so I guess really what matters more than the reason this happened is or isn't because of that person is, okay, right now in this moment and going forward, right? Because that's really where we have the power to, to change. And coming back to, you know, the starting point in this conversation is circumstances versus mindset. I guess in a sense, circumstances might be real and they might make a difference. But oftentimes, a lot of those circumstances are not things that we have the power to affect and to change, as opposed to mindset that we absolutely do. So it just makes sense to focus our efforts there. Yeah, and I think it has what to do also with you mentioned about that, that story with the lottery. Like a person can say, oh, well, I won $10 million, but last week it was $100 million. And so I'm not, I'm not very excited about it. And that, that is very much a mindset thing. But we, we, also, we also have to remember that any, any problem, any situation that comes up, any challenge that we have, Sometimes, in fact, all the time, it's not the challenge itself, it's not the problem itself that's the issue. It's the problem that I have with the problem. In other words, there's what's going on on the outside and what's being, pro what's being processed and the way that I'm interpreting that on the inside. So it's not the problem per se, it's, it's the problem I have with the problem. The, the whole concept of therapy kind of works like that as well, where we're not whitewashing the past. We're not trying to get rid of what happened and make you forget about it. It's understanding it in a different way, impacting you in a different way, looking at it in a different way that allows you to not be confined and held by it. So in a sense, maybe it's more the narrative that you attribute or associate with the problem rather than the actual problem itself. Correct. How am I interpreting what took place? Uh, and if I interpret it in one particular way, the same result, the same situation on the outside is going to produce a different result on the inside, right? So the guy with $10 million, if, if he's looking at the world as glass half empty and he says, oh, I won $10 million, big deal. Last week was $100 million. I wish I would have won then. You know, all of us would be like, what? What do you, what, that, just be happy with what you have, $10 million, that's like, and, it, but it, it does, it, it, it's, it's how, it's, it's not the amount of the value that changes, is how am I interpreting that value, how am I going to look at it? And if I'm always looking at things in the negative, if I'm always seeing glasses half empty, I, I may need to do some soul searching and, and, you know, figure out how to be a little bit more grateful and a little bit more uh, giving and, and uh, understand certain things in my life in a different way. Okay, good. So can you talk maybe about some examples of, of what that, what this sort of examples of a negative mindset that's going to hold someone back in the context of relationships, of dating, of pursuing marriage, of marriage itself? Like, what are some examples of maybe negative mindsets that, that are, you know, common examples that are holding people back and where they're not necessarily wrong, but maybe how those narratives could be rewritten to change, to, to set a person up to, to be more successful? Sure. Well, I mean, ego is something that, that gets in a lot of people's way. Uh, so one of, one of the things that, uh, that comes up a lot in, in the dating world, especially with, with people that are, with, with, with everything, everything in their, in their resume would look, would look fantastic. They're, you know, an attractive person. They are a successful person. They are a well-educated person. All of the all of the details line up, and it's just not, it's just not working out for them in the in the dating world. Uh, sometimes it's it's their ego. They're they're putting themselves on on such a high pedestal that no one is good enough for them. That's that's a when it's when you have that sort of selfish uh, mindset. Um, not that not, not that a person should quote unquote settle, but. There, there, there may be aspects of your personality that are off-putting to other people. Just look at what's going on in the Ivy League schools. Ever since this terrible situation in Israel began on October 7th, you see the eruption of anti-Semitism coming from the Ivy League schools. You, these places that are supposed to be the bastion of education, bastion of scholarship, the ones that we are looking at as the... Of the tolerance uh, and right, of, of tolerance and acceptance. And... And intelligence, the elites of, 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 the, of, of the intellect uh, can, have, can be morally bereft. We see the depravity of, of the value system 
that many of these people are espousing to the world, it, 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 has not, it doesn't correlate with their intelligence. So they, they, may, they may have a resume that's stellar in, in, all, in all other areas, but in the values, in, a, in, a, in the scope of values, they're, they need quite a bit of work. And I think a lot of times if we're honest with ourselves, which is a difficult thing to do in and of itself, if we're honest with ourselves, um, we, can, we can see perhaps it's not necessarily about my resume uh, that is holding me back from meeting the right person uh, or from establishing the right, the, 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 the right type of life that I'd like to live. It, it may be other factors. I could be very uh, advanced and successful in one area of my personality and very immature uh, or selfish in another part of my personality. Uh, you know, children naturally are egocentric, and a lot of times there's a part of us that doesn't grow up. Uh, so we can, be, we can be smarter, we can have learned a lot of things, and we can have advanced in our careers and in other areas of our lives, but there's still a good chunk of our personality that is very immature, that's very childlike, very egocentric. And uh, that's going to be very difficult to have a relationship with somebody that is completely focused on themselves and what are they getting out of it. And maybe something else that might come along with that is re the realization that maybe it's not just because everyone else is so imperfect. Yeah, it's it's funny. You know, a few years ago, I was I was a passenger in a car. We were in a fender bender in New York, obviously, because that's where fender benders live. Um, so uh, we actually hit the the other person because they were driving in a in a very strange way. They they made like a they made like a turn when you're not supposed to make the turn. And uh, we ended up fender bendering into into them, and so we got out. And everyone was polite, and everyone waited on you know on the side of the road for the police to come and make their make their report. And um, this the woman who, who who got out, she says, you know, this is the fourth time that someone has hit me this year. Everyone's always hitting me, <laughs> and so if you have any sort of self reflection if there's any maybe it's not all the drivers on the road that are terrible except drivers for right except for you maybe you're not driving properly maybe you're turning when you're not supposed to turn maybe you're doing something but she said no oh, it's the fourth time this year that everyone's always bumping into me if if we're trying in any area whether it's career whether it's relationship in particular in relationships and we keep hitting dead ends after dead ends after dead end. It's, it's very possible that there's something inward that we maybe need to, to look into, to, to see maybe it's not just everyone's bumping into me, everyone's out to get me, no one appreciates me. Maybe there's, maybe there's an area that you can work on as well. All right, okay, so if we go back to the the metaphor, not metaphor, but the example, right? Of the grandfather with the, the cheese in his nose. Um, in an example like that, he's likely to, he's going to keep walking around thinking that the whole world smells until um, he sneezes and it comes out, you know, until something happens and then he realizes, oh my goodness, that's why everything smelled so bad, right? But until that sneeze comes along, he's not going to realize and he's going to keep thinking that everything and every room, every space smells bad. When it comes to a person and, you know, having maybe a negative mindset and the fact that that's really impacting their experience in a negative way very substantially, it, is a person just destined to continue with that until something happens, you know, the, the sneeze comes along and wakes them up to it? Is Or are, are there, you know, things that a person can do to... Are there signs that a person has to stop and start thinking that way? I mean, we just had this example of the lady in the in you know the car crash, but in general, broadly, what what are maybe some aside from you know, or maybe that is the sign that you know if things keep going wrong for someone, and it's a consistent kind of things going wrong, that's the sign that it's time to start you know introspecting. Maybe oh, so to come at that from a bit of a different angle, right? Because in a sense, I think, and, and it, it's like this with a lot of things, that the person who is either naturally 
by nature or having worked on things over time, a person who is, let's say, relatively self-aware is going to be inclined to pick up on that and say, oh, hang on a second. I keep on having this experience consistently. Maybe I need to change the way I'm looking at it. and Maybe I'm misunderstanding what the cause is. If, you know, and a, a person who's not very self-aware is going to be less likely to realize that they're not self-aware, right? So for that right. person, maybe let's say it is what it is to an extent. Let's say that I'm looking at someone I care about, someone I'm trying to support, someone who's close to me, and I see that they are very stuck and they're completely unaware of this issue and the fact that really it's in their hands and it's in their head and they could change things if they want to. Do you have any insight maybe into how someone can go about, you know, in a way that's going to be constructive and helpful to open someone's eyes to that and to help them become more self-aware and, and to be able to make that progress? Well, so, so sometimes I, I think some people are, are so, they have, they have so much cheese in their nose, let's say, that it does take that big sneeze. It does take that big life-shattering, earth, uh, you know, uh, earth, not earth-changing, earth-shattering, life-changing event uh, in their life, uh, either for the good or for, or for the not good. You know, it's uh, a, a friend or, or a relative's marriage. And they just see, they're so overfilled with, uh, overwhelm, overwhelmed with joy that they decide they want to make some changes in their life to be more in line with that. Sometimes it's something on the opposite where something terrible happens and they start reassessing their life. But without going in that direction, part of the value of, of having a, a spiritual connection and delving into particularly the Torah's wisdom, particularly Hasidus, particularly the Hasidic wisdom, that can help us a lot in, in shaping who we are, where our priorities should be. So, for example, the, the, the concept of divine providence, right? That God is involved in everything in your life and that everything is really meant not, doesn't happen to you. Things don't happen to you. Things happen for you. We don't always understand why and how, and, but everything that you encounter and experience is there for you. I like to say that, that divine providence is kind of like targeted ads that God is, is sending you for what you need. It's what you need for your life. Everything. Everything that someone says to you, everything that happens to you, every situation that you in your life experience are going through is for your growth, right? Don't just go through it, grow through it. That's, that's the idea. And so if a person is opened up to the idea of spirituality, of Hasidic philosophy, in that God's divine providence plays an active role in their lives, I could start thinking, hey, what is this trying to teach me? What is, what is something that inside myself that I may want to reconsider? Where, where is, where, how can I get more in sync with, with uh, the lesson that this is teaching me as opposed to just saying, why me? Why me? The world is against me. What, 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 can I, what can I gain from this and grow from this? Sometimes it's hitting that wall, um, not with the, necessarily the earth-shattering events, but, but, but saying, hey, you know, this is, the way that I'm reacting to this is, doesn't feel right. Doesn't, it's not, this is not, uh, th th this is not the way that it's supposed to be. And, um, you know, I, I may want to re-examine some things. Okay, so if someone, let's say, is becoming self-aware and they're starting to realize, oh, okay, now I see this flaw, now I see this shortcoming, now I realize why people haven't been finding me as interesting, as attractive as I would have expected them to, because I see that I have these flaws that I didn't, wasn't previously aware of. To what extent do those flaws and imperfections then mean that the person is less valuable than they had previously thought they were? Does it does that reduce their their value as an individual? Oh, not at all. I mean, recognizing that there might be some areas and shortcomings is actually is, is something that helps you grow. And you're 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 more. You, you, if anything, your value is enhanced. It's a very liberating experience to be able to acknowledge that you have shortcomings. Because the person that says oh, I have no shortcomings, right? That's that's a person that's very emotionally and spiritually immature, because we all have them. And it's the acknowledgement of them that actually helps you grow and actually makes you, in, in, in quality, in the quality of your life, the, your, your contribution, the value increases because 
because you've, you've recognized that there are flaws and you recognize that there are areas that I need to work on. You know, it's interesting that there, there are different things that are a part of ourselves and it plays a role in relationships. I was, I was telling someone about this the other day. Um, there, there, there are things in our lives that we can't change and that we shouldn't change. And then there are things in our lives that we can change and that we shouldn't change. And then the things that we can change and we should change. So things that we can't change and shouldn't change are the family we were born to, the place that we were born to. Like we, we can't change those things. Like we are who we are. We were born to the family, to the situation, to the, uh, the society that we were, that we were born in. Can't change that. Then there are things that we, like we, like I said, uh, that we can, that we can change, but shouldn't change. So those would be like people doing all sorts of maybe, plastic surgeries uh, to themselves uh, you know <laughs> many many Jewish women are chopping their nose in a, in a hundred different pieces so those are things that can be changed but maybe shouldn't be changed then there are things that can change and should change those are our character traits that you know maybe need some work on them what ends up happening usually though it's so interesting the things that we can't change and we shouldn't change are the things that a lot of people focus on the most. They try to be something that they're not and create this whole background story of who they are and what they are and who they came from and where and, and make themselves into something that they're not. And they, you can't you can't change it. You are who you are. And they spend their whole life focusing on that area. But when it comes to the things that can change and should change, like our character traits, what do they say? Take me as I am. This is who I am. Like it or leave it, right? That's it. And so the we all have to recognize that we have character traits that could use some adjusting. We, we have areas in our lives that we could uh, bring, we could enhance their, their value by, by exploring them in ourselves. It, and a, a, a truly valuable lesson for ourselves and for others. We're not, we're not improving so that others will approve of us. We're improving because our, lo- our lives are geared towards improvement. We, part of our reason of being here is to improve ourselves, to perfect our existence, to, to achieve as, as high as we can in every area of our lives, including and especially in our character, right? To make ourselves more connected, more, more, uh, more altruistic, more uh, focused on the things that are really important. It's not that, oh, I want to improve myself because I want to find the right person. It's like, no, I, I need to improve myself because that's part of my life is I need to improve myself. And I will find a person in my life who respects that, respects that I'm working on myself, respects the fact that I uh, that is willing to even journey with me, depending upon what the uh, the situation is. That is something that only adds value to the relationship, and only adds value to the person for sure. Right, but you know, there's. In a real relationship, when when we envision, I think this is probably true for most people or everyone. When a person envisions their ideal relationship, it's you know a relationship in which you know the person chooses to be with me because of who I am. A person appreciates me because of who I am. No one wants to think, oh, this person chose to be with me. Or oh, maybe some people do, but I think most people probably don't want to think, oh, this person chose to spend their life with me because of this characteristic or because of this achievement or because of my wealth or because of any of those things. You know, and how, how do we balance wanting to, you know, let's say the understanding that, yes, we should develop ourselves and as we improve our characteristics as an individual, that's going to translate into, let's say, better prospects in marriage both pragmatically and maybe somewhat karmically and you know all of those things together but at the same time then not start to see things as oh so now people are going to be more interested in me because of this and because of that which then means that the reason this person wants to spend their life with me is because of this thing that I achieved or this change that I made you know it's on one hand making those changes is a good thing and maybe will be helpful on the other hand we don't want to spend our lives and share ourselves and our lives with someone 
who chose to do that with us because of this characteristic or because of this trait. Well, a lot of times the character flaws that we may be talking about are, are exactly that. They are the things that prevent us from having a relationship with others. So uh, we're not talking about having somebody marry you because they are interested in your money. Obviously, nobody wants that, right? You could be the wealthiest person in the world. You, you want the person to appreciate you for you. The, the, the things that, that oftentimes uh, pr prevent us or, or at least cause a bump in the road from us developing meaningful relationship is that we are too focused on ourselves. And so developing a certain sensitivity, like let's say becoming a better listener, becoming someone who's more sensitive towards uh, another person rather than being so self-focused, that's going to en enhance a person's relationship. But not because of the fact that, oh, now I'm marrying you because uh, you're a better, I am marrying you because you're a better listener, because that's how you develop a relationship after all, right? So it's not like I'm working on myself uh, to, to make my achievements higher so that now I can have someone of a higher caliber who uh, likes, who, who appreciates me at this higher caliber. It's I'm improving myself because this is the right thing to do to, these, to establish a relationship. Um, no matter what areas of, of challenge we have, the, the ones that are going to, uh, the ones that we're focused on when it comes to relationships are the ones that are going to affect relationships the most. Meaning, become a better listener, become a more sensitive person, become a more giving person, right? These may be things that are hard for us to, to develop because we are who we are. We are naturally selfish, ego-centered people. If we can open ourselves up a little bit more, which is a character development trait, that is going to facilitate the creation of a relationship. So the, the couple of words that you said actually very early on there, I want to draw attention to and focus in because I think maybe that phrase, that expression that you said early on might bring a lot of clarity to what's the, you know, a, a distinguishing point here that really makes things clear. At least it did for me as you were speaking, was you talked about addressing things that are going to prevent or get in the way, right? So it, you know, it would it be fair maybe to rephrase that and to say that when we, there's nothing wrong with working on improving our character, even if it's in the interest of improving our, let's say, relationship prospects. But that's not because, oh, I want someone to marry me because I'm going to develop this characteristic so much as, oh, this thing's kind of getting in the way and messing things up. And it makes it harder for someone to appreciate who I really am and to, for me to be able to develop that relationship. So by addressing these things, I'm going to be removing factors that are getting in the way and then allowing people a better, to have a better chance to get to know me and appreciate me. That's right. I am. That's right. Okay. So when it comes to, let's say a person's, you know, had this realization, they realize, oh yes, you know, I have these flaws. I should work on them maybe primarily just for myself and for my own development and progress. And because that's why I'm here, this is a part of purpose of my existence is to work on being everything and everyone that I can be. Also, it's probably a good idea in terms of increasing my prospects of, of finding a fulfilling relationship that, you know, is going to bring me meaning and joy over the course of my life. But like, that's a pretty big project. Where do I start? Can you give maybe some practical pointers on maybe how to prioritize and choose which things to work on? Should we work on all the things at once? Should we choose one thing at a time? What are some practical tips or maybe general rules if there is such a thing for how to go about actually then addressing that and getting that moving forward. So I, I think a lot of times people, uh, maybe, maybe not up front or maybe can't process process the that this is what they're actually looking for, but a lot of people uh, kind of want somebody in their life that is almost like a, for lack of a better term, like a robot that they've kind of pre-programmed. I want my spouse to be this, this, and this, and uh, until I find one that is this, this, and this, with, with all of these particular uh, details, then I'm, I'm not interested. And it's kind of like trying to have a relationship with a robot. You know, you're having a relationship with a robot that you pre-programmed is exactly what you're looking for. You're not going to have much of a relationship with that person because you're really just having a relationship with yourself. That you pre-program the robot and then you're loving the robot. Well, that's pretty. And then when things don't go out, go go the way you expected because of unexpected complications of the things you chose, you're in for real trouble. Yeah, right. it's exactly. So I think I think what we were what we were talking about before would be the key areas that 
that might be the places to start. In other words, those things that are going to be impediments in developing a relationship, being more open, willingness to share your life and your experience with someone else, uh, that, that those would be, would be the areas to, to zero in on, being a better listener, be, having uh, more sensitivity towards where people are, empathy to, to what they're going through. It, it doesn't, it, it's, a person can be an introvert and still have a great desire to share with others. And, and, but it's just, it's it, in the context of, you know, a, a singular relationship, a, a deep and meaningful relationship that they're, that they're willing to share with. They don't want to be out and about and, and uh, being around lots of people is not their thing, but they can be open with others and want to have others open up to them. Uh, so it's not like, I want to not be an introvert anymore. I want to be more extrovert. No, you could be an introvert. You just, it, you have to have that, you know, that willingness that I, in the right context, will, you know, and am open to, to opening myself up and want others to open themselves up to me. So the impediments I think that, that we may want to focus on are those things that would impede a, a deep and meaningful relationship to develop between two people. What about, you know, those are things that are obviously very directly um, going to have a direct impact on a relationship, communication, listening, openness, those sorts of things. What about things that are maybe a little bit deeper where the impact is not going to be as immediately obvious, maybe a little bit less direct, perhaps things like maybe assessing a person's appreciation for why they're really here, what the purpose of their life is, what all of, you know, what all of it means, etc. Would you say that those are important things to process as a part of this um, journey as well? Absolutely. Um, sometimes the best way to confront some of the challenges that we have inside is not to address them head on. It's to eliminate them through delving deeper into ourselves, into who we are, why we're here, uh, what our mission is. It, when we understand why we're here a bit more, a lot of these other uh, challenges in the way kind of kind of go away. It's it's like the, uh, the little boy who has a who, who comes to his parents and says that there's a monster under his bed, right? So there's really two ways that the parents can address the monster under the bed, right? What do you do? You either fight off the monster. Or you chop the legs off the bed, and the and the now the mattress is on the floor. There's no under the bed anymore, right? So sometimes, rather than fighting our monsters inside directly, we could just kind of we can ease the process. Just chop off the bedposts, and now the mattress is on the floor. And now there's no demon. So if I can focus on the things that are really important in my life, and and maybe delve a bit deeper into my spiritual self, the mission that I'm here for, my relationship with God my relationship, which then will filter into my relationship with others, that will help enhance some of the monsters under our bed that uh, we don't have to fight off directly. It will just help us give a better, have a better perspective on what it is that I need and I'm looking for and the whole purpose of getting together with somebody anyway. So how much effort and work should a person anticipate that they're going to have to put in? How much effort and work is worth it um, to, you know, to make this progress and, and, and to develop oneself and, and character? Um, I, I don't want to broad brush and, and, and say, well, you need exa exactly this amount. Uh, I, I, think, I think beginning the journey and it, sort of admitting that maybe it's time to delve deeper, that's, that's the best start. And you'll, you'll grow with the process. And as you grow, your, your perspective of reality will broaden and you'll, it'll open yourself up more for, for opportunities. Rather than saying, all right, this is my six-month program and by six months you're going to be, you know, uh, a new person and you should be a new person. All right. And I guess there are a couple of things that you, you really achieve and shift the approach towards and that is number one is start the process and then you'll find out how much effort it's going to take. Right. And number two is, as you, you said right there, that, you know, as you work on it, you develop and you change and your perspective changes and the way you see things change. So even if you had, let's say you could get hypothetically an exact diagnosis of the amount of effort it's going to take to do it, as you grow through that process, what that effort feels like to you is going to be different also. Right. Right. So, so 
even if we could know exactly how much effort it's going to take, it, it, it's not really relevant to the beginning because as you grow and achieve through that process, what that feels like will be different. That's right. One of the one of the interesting places that we see that, like from a, from a Torah perspective, is in in the Garden of Eden story with with Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve before they before they sinned, uh, our tradition teaches that they saw from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, meaning they had a completely objective perspective of reality. And then what happened after they ate from the tree when they when they weren't supposed to was that their their view of reality completely shifted. It became not an objective view of of right and wrong, of true and false, it became a subjective view of good and bad. And um, so what, 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 what the way in which Adam and Eve looked at the world prior to their sin was objective. Their eyes were functioning as, as a window to reality. They were able to see the objective reality of the world. Post-sin, they, their eyes not fo- they didn't, fo- didn't, didn't function as a window anymore. They focused as a mirror. And everything that they saw in the world was a reflection of themselves. And so our goal, our job in our lives that we, that we have now is to get out of that mirror-based view of reality into the objective view of reality. And that comes through the, the study of Torah, the, the delving into our spiritual selves, and that we, through our own self-development, through our studies and delving deeper into what life is all about, we uh, re- reclaim that objective view. And as we broaden our objective view and get out of ourself, that opens us up much more to having well and meaningful relationships with other people. If, let's say that we have a person who's, you know, become sort of more self-aware and says, I realize, you know, I have these things that I should work on and make progress. And they've tried and they've tried and they've tried. And it's like, you know, it's like, imagine the grandfather realizes, oh my goodness, there's this rotten cheese stuck in my nose and trying to sneeze it out and blow it out and tweezers and Q-tips and he just can't get it out, right? Someone's tried and tried and they're just stuck and not making any progress. Do you have any maybe advice, suggestions for a person who's feeling that stuck about how they can go about maybe getting unstuck? It really, de- I think it really depends on what the what the nature of the issue is. Um, I, I'm a I'm a big proponent of of therapy. That people, if 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 that is the if that is the nature, if it's something impeding in their life in such an ex- in, in an extreme sort of way, or really kind of getting in the way of of them getting to where they want to be, uh, if something has a, a large effect on your life, you should you should you may want to consider. Uh, seeing a therapist, seeing or a coach, or or some someone that that can be helpful in in uh, in ho- helping you along the way. The idea is we want to be open to uh, you know methods that are out there that uh, that that may be helpful. Uh, developing our spiritual life may be something also that uh, that that would be helpful if they've tried maybe one therapist and it hasn't worked. Maybe perhaps try a different one if they try developing their spiritual self with one rabbi or one synagogue, uh, maybe try a different one. What about sometimes, could it even just be like a, a really good friend that you can be open oh, absolutely. with? absolutely. Just maybe someone outside of yourself to give that objective that, look? That is, that, is, that is certainly an option. The, the main thing is to have an objective person that cares about you and cares about your life and your situation and is there to help. And lives outside your head. And it lives outside your head. But also, you want someone with the knowledge as well to, to be able to give uh, proper advice or to uh, you know identify things that it's not that is not you, you want you want someone that's objective and that can that can often be with a friend but also that depends on what your friend circle looks like as well right. so the, the main thing is yes having an objective outside party we, one of the most valuable lessons I think that we have in Judaism that is so uh, neglected, I would say, in American society in particular, is having, your, having a mentor for yourself. That every, every person, uh, Perky Avis, the ethics of our fathers teaches, the Rebbe encouraged so often that a person needs to find for themselves a mentor. Not only someone that they can ask their religious questions to, but someone that is an objective third party that, can, that you can talk to about the, the real stuff in life. And we neglect that. We say, "Oh, I can, I can handle myself. I don't want to, ad- I, you know, I, I don't want to admit that I have any flaws. I don't want to admit that I have any 
challenges or whatever, we all have them when we all need someone to talk to. And some mentors aren't just for millionaires who want to become billionaires. That's right. <laughs> okay, amazing. So that, that was, I think, a lot of insight. I'm still digesting that myself. <laughs> I want to just finish up with one last question. And this is sort of the question that we end off with every episode. If you had to pick your single favorite, favorite or most important piece of advice for people as it pertains to dating and or marriage, what would that piece of advice be? I, I think the most valuable advice for all of us to know as individuals is that you are a human being created in the image of God and that God created you, hand select you for a purpose in this world and that no one else in human history and not in past, present or future can contribute to the world what you contribute. You are special, you are, you are blessed, you are, you are given a particular life mission and purpose that, that no one else can do. And the more we get attuned with what that purpose is, the more we can sort of discover what it is that I, I personally contribute to this world, it becomes a lot easier to find who a partner to do that with would be. So it's not really, and this I guess goes back to your general approach of throughout the conversation is it's not necessarily about advice for dating and marriage specifically, it's advice for life that's going to have a tremendous impact on dating and marriage. Right. It's, if I can, if I can know my mission a bit better, then it becomes, I have a more objective view of who can journey on that mission with me. Right. And also, I guess, have the confidence that comes along with the fact that there is a unique mission and something that's irreplaceable, etc. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you so much.